We greet all of you tonight. They've joined us. It's certainly good to see Sister Maxine, Brother Charlie with us. <laughs> Fellow sojourners. And we welcome those who have joined us on live stream too. We've got people as far as Ghana and Kenya that watch these <laughs> watch these sessions. And tonight we're going to be be beginning in the Gospel of Luke. I call these um, lessons a review. Because it, uh, it's, the text is conducive to a lot more exposition than what I'm going to give. Matter of fact, I thought for a while I bit off too much here, first four verses, but if the beginning isn't clear to you, the rest won't be. That's why I want to spend some time on this. Things most assuredly believed among us. <clears throat> now, believe it or not, you'd find a hard time finding someone who could answer that question. Anywhere. I mean, there are, there are out there, understand. <laughs> but it's just not the kind of question that gets asked. But it was important. It's important to be assured. See, there are, there are millions of believers that aren't sure. It's not altogether their fault. I understand that. And sometimes, just as you begin, you begin that you need your, your assuredness has to be bolstered, your confidence has to be built up. But there's uh, there's not a lot of ministry devoted to this. Most uh, larger mega church ministries and televised ministries, this sort of thing, are devoted, the televisions are devoted to gathering funds. I mean, that's the kind of the main thing. But most of them are, are correction of behavior or solving problems. That's, but see, you've got to be sure that what you believe is the truth. Amen. Not one, two, three, four, five things you believe but the things pertain to Christ. I've, I have done this personally. Ask people, what do you know about Jesus? It doesn't take them long to tell you. I'm not talking about what he said, I about his person. What do you know about Jesus? I just, just uh, admonish you to ask that question to a few people. It may, may open a door of opportunity for you to bear some meaningful witness to them, but it's just not in the, in, the, in the Christian culture of our day, this is just not the kind of question you ask. I've mentioned this before, but the face of Christendom has changed, it's been altered. It's not the same as it was 40 or 50 years ago. It's changed, there's been a complete change in the, in the structure, mental structure of Christianity. It's been completely altered. Different emphasis, different view of God, different view of Christ, different view of the gospel. It's just completely different. But this, Luke thought this necessary to clarify the things that are most certainly believed to someone who believed. And so this is in order to, uh, to do this. I'll read the text first. Luke wrote the book of Acts. And he refers to this gospel in the book of Acts as the former treaties, he calls it then. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them to us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty, the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Amen. All right, now this, uh, 
this, as I understand it, is a divine priority, to know the certainty of the things that are believed among us. Now, this letter written, as we understand, to a government official, we're not, there's just not a lot of information about Theophilus anywhere. But uh, he evidently was some sort of a political official. We don't know how high or exactly what he did, but Luke had come in contact with him some way. He wrote, he wrote the book of Acts later as a kind of a continuation of what was the result of Christ's life and resurrection and ascension. And so he writes to assure Theophilus that this is solid, this is solid stuff that we've embraced. This is not a theory or what or an idea of what the Bible means or something like this. This isn't that. This is certainty. And, and he's going to establish, and I'll, I'll deal with this extensively, he's going to establish the certainty of it not by an argument. He's not going to introduce a certain line of reasoning. He's just going to tell you what happened. See, affirmation is infinitely more powerful than explanation. In fact, the more you explain it, the less clear it can become. It first will be affirmed or stated or proclaimed or preached as just got that because the power is in the message, not in the explanation of the message. Oh, we got to see that. If you don't keep proclaiming this message, it eventually will fade from the understanding. The gospel's got to be preached to the church. In fact, the epistles are an exposition of the gospel. That's what they are. It's all there. The, all the gospels, the power is all resident in that, in that message. The gospel will shed light on the seriousness of tampering with the message. Now, I've mentioned this before, but beginning at the age of enlightenment, there came a scholastic liberty in handling scripture that didn't exist before. All higher criticism started at that time. Now, just as a passing fact of interest, the first English version of the Bible was published in 1485. The first revision was 1885, 500 years later, or 400 years later. 400 years later was the first time the English was revised. The spelling was changed, you know, the S's looked like F's and things like that. But the basic English, the way of articulating in English the truth of God was unchanged for 400 years, four centuries. And beginning with the first revised English version, a plethora of versions began to come out. They really blossomed in 1957 was the revised standard version, which was written up all over the place. We had tracts and all kind of reaction from the churches because of the liberty of that version, which was the first version to say maiden instead of virgin, you know, and temple prostitute instead of sodomite and things like that. But now since then, I've got 48 versions myself. And it's broke out because something happened during the Enlightenment when they kicked God out of scholarship and exalted human reason. All right, none of that existed when Luke wrote. The closest thing you may have got to it was Gnosticism, and it was kind of beginning to take hold back in those days, but it's, it's, a, it's a represent a different way of thinking. But the believers, there was a consistent way believers thought for quite a while. And that's why Luke could write this. I'm going to set forth a declaration of things most, most assuredly believed among us. That's why he could say that, because there, all this, this theological change hadn't taken place yet. There were some departures, but they were, they were unusual. They weren't, uh, they weren't the norm at all. 
So God, uh, God has not called us to a religious system. That's not what, that's not what truth is not a system. It's, it's systematic if you, can, if you get up high enough. It is systematic and orderly, but it is not a, a theological, systematic way of thinking as men think of it. It's not that way because there's a, there's a mysterious element in the gospel that can't be systematized. You finally come to the point you find out his ways are past finding out and unsearchable, see? That element is in the gospel. That's why it, that's why it can't be systematized, see? But religious men have tried to systematize it, and the reason they did is because there's, there's, there's this tendency in mankind to veer off on rabbit trails. All through, all through history, that's, and that's what these reformers and so forth, that's what they were trying to do is get people back on the highway that's been raised up. The fundamental knowledge about God and Christ, see, that is what comprises eternal life. Everyone understands that. This is eternal life. They might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has, whom he has sent. That's what eternal life is. It's knowing, comprehending, familiarity with, acquaintance with God and Christ. That's what eternal life is. And we know the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we might know Him that is true. We're in Him that is true, even in God and the Son, Jesus Christ. This is eternal life. See, that's eternal life. So you can't be wrong about God and Christ. You can't. You can't. You've got to be right about Jesus. Because that's what eternal life is, see? This is why he's writing this, this book. Now, there's a kind of a kind of a vague sense of this in religious circles, but there's been some leniency that's been allowed. For instance, you can't really be wrong about why Jesus died. You, the death of Christ, you've got to have a grip on what that's about. You can't be wrong about what Jesus is doing now as a high priest interceding, mediating, so you can't be wrong about that. And you can't be wrong about the second coming of Christ either. You can't. You can't. There's only three appearings of the Lord mentioned in Hebrews 9. He appeared once in the end of the world to put away sin. He's now appearing in the presence of God. He shall appear without sin. You can't be wrong about any of those. But see, almost invariably people allow for different views of the second coming of Christ. They allow for different views about some facet of Christ. And because of kind of the environment that's been created and been in place for now several decades now people are very lax about this but see Luke <laughs> he says I'm going to I want to write about the certainty of these things that most surely believed among us you got to you got to have it right when you talk about Jesus you've got to be right you can't be spouting off about what you think God thinks of everybody and what you think Jesus thinks of everybody you had better be right that's why this gospel is uh, is written. <clears throat> now I want to say a few words about Luke before I begin. He was not an apostle. Like James and Jude, they weren't either. They weren't apostles. Mark wasn't either. We under at least tradition says he that Peter told him what to write. Where, we really don't know that for sure, but you never want to state an opinion of history as being factual. That's just something to consider. We're not, we're not sure. But at any rate, he wasn't an apostle. Yet he wrote some in, intriguing accounts that none of the other apostles mentioned. He's the only one that gave an account of the replacement of Judas. He's the only one that gave the first preaching of the gospel, or the first Jewish converts, or the first Gentile converts. He recorded the first incarceration of apostles. He recorded the first purging of the church with Ananias and Sapphira. He recorded the turning of an entire city at the preaching of one man, the city of Samaria, the preaching of Philip. 
He, conver he was the first one recorded the conversion of a person from another country going back home. Ethiopian eunuch. First, he's the only person to report the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, conversion at the household of Cornelius. He recorded the first doctrinal issue the church faced, which was circumcision. They called a conference to, and they did not, they did not leave that conference till that problem was solved. Now, I personally participated in 25 annual conferences on unity that after they quit, we still didn't have the unity. The problem was not solved, and it was rarely addressed. See, but the early church, they were, when they come across something that they knew it wasn't ideal or suspicion that wasn't right, they did not leave that thing until it was resolved. And Luke records that first, and he's the only one that provides a documented account of Paul's ministry. We understand from the, even from the name Luke that he was a Gentile, and it was not, at least it wasn't a common practice for Jews to give Greek names to their children. He's only mentioned a couple times. Paul mentions him. One version, King James Version, refers to him as Lucas which is a transliteration of the Greek word Lucas. Because he was a Greek, he has a Greek name, it's assumed he was a Greek. And also it, su it suggested he was a Greek by a testimony that Paul gave in Colossians 4, 11 to 14, where he's, he had a conference among people that were circumcised, and here's what he said, in Jesus, which is called justice, who are, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers into the kingdom of God, which have been in comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, it's Colossae, it's Gentile, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers, so forth. And at the conclusion of this, he says, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis, Luke, See, he didn't, he didn't group him with the circumcision up there. So we assume, and it is an assumption, I understand that, but he was a, he was a Gentile. And no other scriptural writer was a Gentile. This is like it. From the beginning to the end, this is the only Gentile. It's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> if that's all I knew, I wouldn't be against the Jews, if that's all I knew. And he was a physician, he was a doctor. Paul referred to him as a beloved physician. It's generally assumed, and I think I agree with it, that he probably ministered to Paul in his of infirmity, traveled with him, was a consistent companion of him. The only consistent companion of him. He surfaces in Acts 16, right after Paul had this dream, vision, about a man in Macedonia, a man, saw a man in Macedonia, saying, come over and help us. When they got over there, they found a group of women. <laughs> but that's who they wanted, that's who he wanted to minister to. And at that point, in Acts, Luke begins to say, us. He's included. Now, I won't read all these, but I list for you the, the places Luke was. Because he doesn't talk about himself. He didn't editorialize. <laughs> so you forget that where he was. He, he was the call to Macedonia. He was there. He was present in Macedonia when they met that woman with the spirit of divination. He was at the household of Lydia. He was in a trip they took to Asia. He sailed to Mytilene. He was there when Agabus prophesied. When he entered back to Jerusalem, he was there. He, when Paul went into James, he was there. When sailing to Italy, he was there. When continuing to Italy from Lycia, he was there. During that storm and shipwreck, where they ended up in Lyle and Melita, he, he, was, he was there, us, he was there. He was the chief, island, uh, uh, the chief of the island Publius, he was there. When many of the island were healed, he were healed. He was he was there, and when Paul arrived in Rome, he was there. 
Uh, see, I don't know when I was young, I didn't think about, you know, I didn't think about things like this, but that's remarkable because that, that spanned a period of about 10 years. If it's proper that the book was written somewhere between 56 and 60, somewhere in there, which we, it, it's pretty sure that's what happened. He was with, continually, without interruption, with Paul for 10 years. And Paul's on the move all the time, in prison a lot of the time, and shipwrecked. He records three, and then the one in Acts 28, it wasn't listed, so four, four shipwrecks. So Luke, what a man, what a man. He was. Luke confessed he wrote this book because he said, I had a perfect understanding from the very first. You know, I'll, I'll read you what some of the other versions say, but... And what some other people have said about about Luke, Irenaeus, and Origen, and some of these men said good things about him, but he's he's a kind of unique writer of scripture, kind of different. That teaches you something there. See that God's not locked into only this kind of people sort of thing, unless they're born again people. He uh, he used a, a fellow that was trained for something else. <laughs> <laughs> the apostles, they're like, this is where they lived with Jesus for three years. They'd never left. That was just all with them all the time. Went to a wedding. They were with them. The only time they weren't with them is when he went up to a mountain to pray someplace. He'd send them off someplace else. Didn't meet them. But here's, here's Luke. It's evident he did devote his life to the Lord. Amen. We've mentioned this before. And, uh, I surely don't want it to be a hobby horse, but whatever ability you've got, give it to Jesus. Give your intellect to Jesus. If you are a, a disciplined thinker, give your mind to Jesus. That doesn't mean you can't make a living and things like that, but give your mind to Jesus. Whatever you've got an aptitude for, give it. It's wrong to give it to somebody else. It's not right. Give it to Jesus. If you have a, a job, don't work for the employer, work for Jesus, and you'll be giving him the very best labor you could give him and to do that. We're told to do that, whatever we do. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the, now there's something to learn in this. Luke knew that Paul was the primary person between the two of them. They're like the men, remember, that fought with David. They jeopardized their lives, and David told them I didn't have to do that. He said, no, he says, your life is worth 10,000 of ours. You're more important than we are. That's the attitude Luke had. Luke, Luke knew Paul was more important than he was. Not because of Paul's person, but because of the commission that had been given to Paul, because he was given to see things that nobody else wrote about or mentioned. I compiled a list of some of these. 75 things Paul taught that nobody else taught. Was it because the others were deficient? No, no. Because Paul was an apostle of the Gentiles, and God had told the Jews, he said, you provoke me to jealousy by gods that were no gods. Now, and Paul brought this up in Romans, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy by a people that's not a people. So he gives their apostle more <laughs> than the others got to provoke them to jealousy. Well, I, I, I hate to say this, but the Gentiles dropped the ball. The Gentiles are never going to convert the Jews. They <laughs> forget it. It's not going to happen. But that's, what, that's why Paul got received more. And then he told you. He told you why. He says, I do this so I might provoke them to jealousy. <laughs> he told you why he, was, why he was preaching to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were not the end objective of the thing at all. Luke was a participant in all of that, and he deferred. See, he deferred to Paul. But I think it's important to note that Luke's prominent place in giving us this record, though, was by his association with the Jew. Oh, yes. Uh, a, of, of the race of 
whom God had granted this revelation for generations and generations. They were the only ones whom God revealed these yeah. things to. And the only part of the reason why Luke could do this is because of that connection he had to the Apostle Paul, same with, who was Jewish. Same with Cornelius. Yeah. In fact, every, everywhere you know, we trace this when we went through Acts, it's interesting when you just finally decide what does the book say. After half your life, you've been believing what somebody else said about the book. And I finally said, I'm going to find out for myself. You find out every single city Paul went to where there was a synagogue, that's the first place he went, yes. was to the synagogue. Even in Athens. That's right. In the synagogue in Athens first. first. And then he'd go, to, he'd go to people that were idol worshipers, that were devout religious people. He's the first people he went to. We have no idea what he said to the heathen at Melita. Does it, he healed several, doesn't say anything about him preaching there. I imagine he did, but he doesn't say anything about it at all. See, the first people that should be converted are people that have some kind of knowledge of God and the superiority of God. Those are the first people. And Paul made a practice of gathering around him He'd go someplace and there'd be some of those that go with him on his trips and some places in Acts he'll name off nine or ten people that were with him when he traveled. This is the practice he had. He would pick up competent laborers, see. He didn't have like a young people's ministry. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but he didn't. And Luke, he's part of this all along, observing all this and I imagine participating in it to some to some degree. Now, it might be of interest to you to know that some people, some of the early church fathers thought that that uh, Luke was the other companion of Cleopas on the road to Emmaus, which in a sense makes sense because he doesn't mention his name. He doesn't, he doesn't tell us who that was, like John never refers to himself. So it's, it's an interesting thing to think about at any rate. Now about Theophilus, as I said, there's there's, all we can say is what I said. There's, we don't know anything else about him. So Luke begins by saying, For as much as many have taken in hand to sit in order, for, for as much, for as much, in as much are seeing that. This is, I'm writing in view of this consideration. A lot of others have set out to do what I'm doing. But evidently, he's not talking about Matthew and John. <laughs> You're not talking about them. Many others that you can hardly say two is many. So you're talking about people that saw things Jesus did and tried to write it down, but it, it evidently wasn't uh, wasn't sufficient. They took it in hand to do this. It, they weren't divinely guided like Luke was. Now you notice here that Luke is aware of what's happening in his time. He's aware of the religious climate. See, in our day, they wouldn't have any idea who wrote what, when they wrote what, and is there a book in the bookstore? They'd have no idea. This is not the kind of framework that modern people are, Christians are in. This is not the way they are. They really don't know what's happening. I can, uh, I was a director of church development for a while, and every place I went, and I talked to the ministers that they said, we had no idea what it was like out here. Nobody, nobody told them the state the churches were in. Yeah, everyone, nobody said they knew. Nobody said they knew. It was just took them by surprise. They kind of thought it was kind of an ideal environment, see? But it wasn't at all. That's not the kind of environment that existed in the first century. They knew what was going on. That other people tried to write a synopsis of Christ's life. Luke is fully aware of this. He knew what they said. He knew how they went about doing it, and he saw this is not sufficient. We've got to have some more said on this subject. That's why he wrote, Jesus himself 
several times he said, you have heard that it hath been said, <laughs> but I say it, you see, so he, he kept abreast. See, there's a lot of colloquialisms, religious colloquialisms that have sprung up in the past few years that are not what the scripture says. Like, like some people, you would, you, they'd say, have you prayed the sinner's prayer? And I once said, well, is there any other kind? <laughs> See, there's nomenclature sprung up. See, it's, it's sprung up and people, they think it's unconditional love. Thank you, Dr. Dobson. He's the one that introduced that. But people think that's in the Bible. Many have taken it in hand. See, it's the same, same thing has happened, except with Luke, it was about the person of Christ. That is what it was about. Many have taken it in hand. Jesus, uh, very conscious about what churches teach. He said in one of the churches in Revelation, he said, you've got some people there that hold to the doctrine of Balaam and some others that hold to the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which doctrine I hate. I can tell you that in the modern church environment, there are people that have quirky ideas, but it's tolerated because, well, they have a right to their opinions. So but that's not how Jesus thinks. Amen. Nobody in the kingdom of God has right to an opinion about anything that has to do with God. Yeah. If God's revealed something, nobody has a right to some kind of a private view of it yeah. at all. That's why the apostles wrote. That's why they raised up against people who said the wrong thing about circumcision or the wrong thing about eating meats or something like this. They'd rise up. Because if you know the truth, it'll make you free, but only if you know it. Amen. Only if you know it. You'll be bondage otherwise. Jesus spoke of the blind leading the blind and both fall in the ditch. See? The apostles and elders came together to, because they, some people went out from Jerusalem now. They went out from the mother church. We're teaching, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you can't be saved. They, it was, such, it was so far off the path that they couldn't settle it in Antioch of Syria. They, they had prophets there. There were prophets there. They couldn't settle that, so they sent some to Jerusalem, to the apostles and elders, to settle that issue because they knew you can't expect Christ to work in the context of error. This is not going to happen. You could be nice and smile and say what you want to say, but it's got to be truth. He's a God of truth. And in Paul's letter to the Galatians, he said, um, I mean, you, you left him, that was God, who called you into the grace of Christ. You left him to embrace another gospel, which is not another. That's how serious it was. That's how serious it was. And they had bought it into this thing of circumcision, too. And Paul had to speak to them quite extensively. There were some people at Colossae that were trying to bring in philosophy and the observance of Jewish feasts. And Paul said, don't, don't let this happen. There, won't let it happen. At Corinth, there were some people that said the dead didn't raise. And Paul had been there 18 months, a year and a half. But as soon as he left, the vultures swooped in. And they convinced some of those people that the dead aren't raised. What did Paul, boy, I'll tell you, Paul got on that. Right away. And in 2 Corinthians, he said, Now, when I come again, I'm going to know the power of these men. I'm not going to have kids' gloves on when I get there. Why? Because what's wrong it must not be taught. And Paul addressed a saying that was said about him. It word was being circulated. He said, Let's do good that grace may abound. You know? He didn't let that pass. Say, Well, God's for us. You know, that's nothing's going to happen. He didn't let that pass. It'd be like letting Satan's suggestion pass in garden, in the garden. You can't listen. If you listen to what's wrong, you're going to be hurt. Just like Eve was hurt. We all want to learn from this. You want to hold a dialogue with someone that's off base, you've you got to know what you're doing, to say the least. 
And Jude told his readers, he said, some crept in unawares. <laughs> well, when he described them, whoo, he described who they were. You think, how did they sneak in? How did they get in under the radar? How? It's because of what they'd been taught. They had a kind of a mamby-pamby kind of a gospel that just made people think it was all right. So this is why Luke wrote. He knew that this type of circumstance is wrong. And I'm going to set forth in order. I'm going, there's, a certain, there's a certain sequence that's got to be seen. It's not sequence after the order of men and flesh, understand. For instance, in godly reasoning, first there's law, then there's transgression. See, it's a certain kind of a certain kind of a sequence. First there's putting away sin, then there's justification. First there's justification, then there's glorification. See, there's a certain order. Jesus was born. Jesus was raised up. He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. He was a, what a 12-year-old ought to be. That's what he was at 12. And he advanced. He ministered. He suffered. He died. He was buried. He rose. Ascended to heaven. See, that sequence, you, it had to be that way. You couldn't start out glorified. You couldn't start out. Adam was a full-grown man when he was made. Not Jesus. He was, it was a certain order. And when he said many had taken in hand, he's talking, as I understand it, about spurious gospels. So there were a lot that raised up after, after 100 A.D., but there evidently were some that raised up then, but I take it that the apostles squelched them before they got out of hand. And I list some of them, some of the spurious gospels here. In the Gospel of Judas, for example, the Gospel of Judas says that Jesus tried to talk Judas into betraying him so that his, Jesus' spirit, would be liberated from his human body. That's in the Gospel of Judas. <laughs> and in the uh, Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of the Egyptians, they taught that sexual acts within marriage are wrong and that f salvation is not obtained by faith but through mystical knowledge. See, so these things began to grow up. Now, as time continued to march toward the consummation of the ages, the caliber of Christian leaders began to deteriorate. And I, now I'm going to give my opinion on why this happened. It's my opinion. It was largely owing to the growing dominance of institu institutionalization. See, the church, when it became popular, under Constantine, then the next thing was institutionalized. That being a downward descent, there became a reliance on academics and educational accreditation, and things began to go slowly downhill. Even though some people thought these formalizations protected the truth, it ended up in opening a door to delusion. And it took the church too long to catch on to what happened. It took it too long. I know it's, it's easy to look back on it and kind of assess it, but when it, the same thing can be happening in our generation. There can be a decided deterioration that's going on, and if Satan can, say can just get the people to turn their head and pretend like it's not there, he's got them. Just as surely as he had Eve, he's got them. So that's what we got to learn from this. You can't turn your head when you when you see something and you see it's wrong. You have to do something about it. Yes. First, protect your own soul. Yes. Don't don't give your soul in exchange for some bauble. The fact that there was a tar tardy dealing with these things is what caused sectarianism, denominationalism to rise, and groups to crystallize because there was no inhibiting factor that was dominant. See, it was, there was a kind of a spiritual vacuum that was developed around three, three or 400 A.D. There's a spiritual vacuum developed in which all kind of spurious things could grow. 
it started way back in Luke's day, but he, he addressed it, you see. The things, I'm, I'm writing a declaration, a declaration, not an explanation, a declaration of those things which are most surely, surely believed among us. Now at the present time, there are 14,000 major Christian denominations. It can be dug. I got the list. I mean, it, there's 326,000 minor denominations. Yeah. You know, the Church of Christ, non instrumental, has 19 major divisions and 42 minor ones, and they all condemn each other. Yeah. People have got used to this, see? See, the point I'm making is. Luke was conscious of what this kind of thing does. But it's like very few people see. Some people know this wrong and they try and do something about it, but they're not energetic enough. They don't put out enough effort. They're not going to rescue many people from this disastrous way of thinking. Part of the influence of the truth is its singularity. Truth is always in the singular in Scripture. You never read truths. Now, the NIV uses truths two times, but the word is a sin is singular. Truth is always singular. Doctrine is always singular. The only time doctrines are mentioned is false doctrines, doctrines of men, and so forth. But truth is in the singular. singular. It's, a, it's a, a body of harmonious reality. If any part is missing, it's not truth. If some part is added, it's not truth. If you are scribes and Pharisees and you have this cherished tradition, so you add this tradition to the Word of God. And Jesus said, you voided. You voided the Word of God, and the Word of God has no more power now that you've added this. Little. See, the Word of God plus tradition equals tradition. It's not the Word of God anymore. That's why a lot of these Bibles that are out there that have a half a page comment and half a page text, these aren't Bibles. These are commentaries. They should strike the name Bible off the cover, take it off, call it commentary. But it's intolerable. It's intolerable. God will not, God will not endure this. To take His Word and add to it something of equal weight that had its origin in the minds of men. Paul, Pete Luke says, I took, I took it, I'd taken it in hand to write something here to offset this. Now, in my judgment, things are a lot worse than they were in Luke's day. We have entered into what God revealed to Amos as a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. This is Amos, the ninth chapter. Not a famine of the Word of God, a famine of hearing. A famine of hearing. Now, there's not a... I talk to people sometimes in the hundreds per day that are very concerned that it's so hard to find the truth someplace. And some places in our country, like you go far east, far west, it's like a desert spiritually. Man, there's nothing. You just travel out there, Arizona and California and up in the northeast. They're just very barren, very barren places where the truth doesn't exist. It's not heard. Why isn't it heard? It's because God has sent a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Here's how God told him why he did it. The people corrupted my word. The priests corrupted the service of God. So I just, I'm not going to let people prophesy anymore. If they do it to be their own words. This is why. This is why you don't hear a lot of God's word, particularly on the media, which determines how the foreign countries think about Christianity. This is why you don't hear it. God has dried it up. you got, you got to see this. And Luke is writing, so this will not happen. So that there will be a fresh perspective of Christ that is true and not false. Things that are surely believed among us. Us. See, there is an us and a them. <laughs> there is. Us 
has people in Christ, people that are free, people that are born again, people have been added to Christ, people have been added to the church. That's who he's talking about, us. Amen. There's some things we, we're, we are who we are because of what we believe. Yep. Most surely believe, most surely. Uh, now let me give you some of the other translations on most surely believed. New King James Version says, which have been fulfilled among us. The NIV, things accomplished among us. Again, it has a footnote, been surely believed. New American Standard, things accomplished among us. Basic Bible English, those events which took place among us. Darby's Version, the matter is fully believed among us. Yeah, it's different, it's different. Those things whereof we are fully persuaded, Geneva Bible. Those events of which we have full assurance, that's Murdoch's Bible. Things which are surely known among us, Tyndale. Things that have, have been fully assured among us, there's Young's literal. The certainties which have taken place among us. The facts which have been received with full assurance among us, and I won't read all of them, but there's these two views presented. One is the things that happened among us and the things that are surely believed among us. Now, which one of those are right? It's the latter, which are surely believed. In the first place, there were some things that happened that didn't happen before the multitudes. Nobody, for instance, saw Jesus rise from the dead. But it happened. Amen. And it was believed. It was believed. No one saw Jesus what happened when he was buried. He said, while he's in the grave, he said he was, he was waiting for the joy of God's countenance again, to see his joy of his countenance. Nobody saw that. Nobody saw him be exalted in heaven. They saw him go up. They didn't see the, the the foundational things of our faith were not witnessed. People saw Jesus die, but they didn't see what was really happening behind the behind the scenes. Sin being put away, and Jesus made a curse, and Jesus made to be sin for us, and making an end of the law, and bringing in everlasting righteousness. See, all of that that wasn't seen. So, but these are surely believed among us, even though no one really witnessed any of that happen. So I'm proceeding on the assumption that it's talking about what's believed, not what's happened, not what happened among us. <clears throat> and beside that, I think that's more text contextually correct. It blends better with the text. Luke's Gospel is estimated to have been written between 60 and 70 A.D., sometime in there. So it contains records of Paul arriving in Rome, which is close to 60 A.D. Now, if all of that is true, somewhere between 30 and 40 years had elapsed <clears throat> since Jesus went back to heaven. When this is written, it's 30, 40 years had elapsed. Now, there's a whole bunch of people that weren't living <laughs> when these things happen. See, to see that happened, they were accomplished among us. See, there's a lot of people that couldn't say something like that, that did believe them, but they couldn't say they, we saw them happen. They, they heard about them. For any foreign, anybody outside the confines of Jerusalem didn't see any of it happen. But they believed it. So it's things that were believed, not things that just happened. The city, the synagogue, the synagogue, proclaiming the thing yeah, that happened in Jerusalem. None of those people in those places yeah, saw it, but saw they it. heard and many believed. That's right. There's one faith. So there's yeah. all of these had a common faith. In fact, Peter said, "You have a like precious faith as ours." That's the apostles. They didn't have a different kind of faith. They had the same faith. It was employed for a different purpose, but it was the same faith. Yes, Judah. He told Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have yeah. believed, and our faith is the evidence of things hoped for, yeah. the, it's the, or the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see what, you see what a situation has developed. If you talk this way in the public, 
people will say, well, what, do, what does your church believe? <laughs> it's just how people think. What is your church to believe? Who, who cares what your church believes? What do you believe? The faith, of course, the, the early church churches were noted for their faith. Paul says, oh, we heard about your faith and love. Said the Colossians, Ephesians, we heard about your faith and love. Said to Rome, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Amen. Well, what are folks saying about us? Yeah. Yeah. Or you or whoever? Yeah. What is being said? See, the whole uh, religious system, we got to see this, brethren. A religious system has been put in place that you have no idea what the individual thinks. It's what the institution stands for that is the point. But before the throne of God is what the individuals stand for who comprise the, the congregation. That's what we're telling you among us, the things that are believed among us, and even as they were delivered unto us, we, uh, we, heard, we heard the message. See, this contradicts the, those translations say, which were accomplished among us. He turns right around and says, these were delivered. <laughs> these were delivered to us. We heard a message about them. These were the apostles. He's talking about the apostles. And God has set, this is stated in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 8, 12 28, He has set in the church first first apostles. To far as your doctrine is concerned, it starts with the apostles. First, the apostles. The apostles, apostles established the doctrine, the foundation. They established that. And then everybody else built on what they, what they laid down. Insofar as the preeminence of Moses and the prophets. See, the church isn't built on Moses and the prophets. Jesus said Moses and the prophets were until John. That's what he said. Moses and the prophets were until John. Now see, I was exposed to teaching and said Jesus ministered under the law. No, he didn't. No, he did not. The law and the prophets were until John. And from John the Baptist to Pentecost was an interim, yes. an interim period where the establishment of Jesus as the Son of God was made known. And Jesus said a lot of things that flat out contradicted what Moses said because it was speaking of internal instead of external. He didn't understand. When I say contradict, I don't mean it. He was in opposition to it. I mean, Moses didn't speak at that level, yeah, that's right. the level Jesus spoke at. <clears throat> now, they delivered them to us, he said. The early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the doctrine. That's the, we talk about the core doctrine. See, I know you understand this, but I want to go over it again. The doctrine of the apostles was the core foundational teaching. For instance, rebuke is not doctrine. Correction and righteousness, that's not doctrine. That's teaching to get you back to the right doctrine. Correction and righteousness and, and correcting behavior, straightening it out errors. See, that's in order to get people over here on the foundation again where something can happen. Because if you're trying to build on something that's not truth, your house is just going to collapse. It's not going to stand the storm. Amen. So doctrine of the apostles is the core teaching they gave, the foundational teaching they gave. They delivered them unto us. And obviously, they, we believe them, believe what they said. Now, what uh, this changes the apostles. I mean, the point I'm establishing here is the apostles receive things that nobody else received. If you're going to get the truth taught to them, you're going to have to get it from them. 
The Lord is not going to teach you in a dream or some private interpretation what he gave the apostles to say. He's not going to give it to somebody else. He may give you to comprehend it. Now, we understand that. He may open your eyes to see it, but he's. But the thing that's said, the foundation bill, was, was articulated by the apostles because it was given only to the apostles. If you put away, for instance, the apostles of the Gentiles, if you put away Paul's writings, you will never be able to arrive at an understanding of those teachings on your own. You may even study Master Moses and the Prophets. You will never see what he was given to see. They were set first in the church. Here's how, here's how it works. And it's uh, depicted by John in the Isle of Patmos. There's a certain way God reveals things. In the economy of Christ, God gives it to Christ. Christ gives it to the Spirit. Spirit gave it to the apostles. The apostles gave it to the church. The church gives it to the world. That's the way it works. Church can't ignore all the other. <laughs> it's got to get it that way. I'm talking about what's preached. See, the, the Lord didn't send us out to preach how to mend marriages. <laughs> God bless the people trying to mend messages, mend marriages, but that's that's not the message. That's not what we've been commissioned to preach. There's too many pre people preaching that, or correcting behavior, or overcoming habits, or you know, things like this. You've got to preach the apostles' doctrine if you want divine results. There's enough of it in Scripture. Nobody should be in question about it, and yet you've got. Peter, John, and Paul. Most of the doctrine was delivered by Paul. And I, I compiled a list of 75 things Paul taught that nobody else taught. Was, but it was revealed to him. He, he didn't conclude this. He didn't study the Bible real hard and conclude it. It was revealed to him. Nobody else said boo about the Lord's Supper, about what it meant or anything. Gospel writer just just cited the event. That's 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 all they did. Paul he told you a lot of things about. It. He said, "You see, you fool around at this table, you'll get sick and you may die." Nobody else said anything like that. The doctrine is built on the the teaching is built on the apostles' doctrine. But now I'm going to wax bold and say that it's my persuasion that the majority of preaching in the last 40 years has not been on the foundation. It's been off the foundation. It's been the kind of doctrine you could build an institution with, but the fruit of it tells you it's bogus. The fruit of it tells you it's bogus. Everybody in the world knows that professing Christians for the most part are not godly. There are some among them that are. We praise God, we're not saying there aren't. We're saying that that's not the general picture. And it's because they've been on the wrong diet. Amen. Well, you say, maybe they heard the truth and didn't obey it. No, in Scripture, if they didn't hear the truth, they'd leave. Listen, the Pharisees didn't follow Jesus around and listen with an open ear to everything he said. They... They left. People don't love the truth, won't sit around listening to it. People have an inclination toward it. They may be as rough as a corn cob, so to speak, but if they have a bent for the truth, they'll stick it out and God will save them. That's the way it works. Some of us are proof of this. Apostles' doctrine. There are things revealed to the apostles that are uh, not revealed to anybody else. Now, what I was about to say is this puts a different light on what they call the Great Commission. This puts, puts a different... Now, I was raised up a Great Commission boy. And it was some time before I realized, hey, this, these words aren't even in the Bible. It, how come I'm using these words? They're not in the Bible anywhere. And no, there's no record of any Christian ever being told those words. Why not? Because when Jesus is in a person, you don't have to tell them these words. You can persecute people that have Jesus and they'll go everywhere preaching the word. See, here you've got this strange anomaly. 
The early church was never of any record of them being told that, quote, Great Commission, and they went out and preached everywhere, and today people are told to do it, and they don't do it. Why not? Because Jesus has left the house. Okay, I've been building on Jesus. I think the time has come for people to stop trying to force fruit. Jesus... If Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, which he did, do you really think he can live in you and you not be have that same desire? Do you think that's even possible? No, it's not possible at all. See, so that's why Luke is doing what he's doing, laying down a record of uh, things that are most surely believed among us. Then he said, these were, these were the ones that were eyewitnesses. Jesus chose them. And the choosing of them is found in Luke 6, 13 through 16, among other places. And it says that after he, he lists the names, he says he ordained 12 that they should be with him. Huh? They were all the time. They should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Now that was unique. Nobody else was invited to like stay with him all the time. He would send the multitudes away. He sent them away. Several times this is said, and he sent them away, but never did he send the disciples away. One time he sent them to the other side while he went to pray. But that was he met them on halfway across there. You remember he met them. Remember he said to them, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into some truth. Now, that's the way it is with us. Well, that's not the way it was with them. He'll guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall not glorify, he shall glorify me, and, and he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said, said I that he will take of mine, and shall show it. That's everything, everything Jesus had to communicate to humanity he gave to the Spirit to give to the apostles. So they, they had a plenary <laughs> inspiration. And they stuck to what they were supposed to say. They weren't pulled off into some kind of a bypath. They stuck with what they were to say. In this arrangement, certain benefits are enjoyed by members of the body that come through the apostles. And then there's other gifts distributed. There's things... Each member of the body has received a pro an appropriate gift. There are no giftless members in the body of Christ. He dealt a measure of faith, called a major, spiritual gifts, they're called in 1 Corinthians 12, a measure of faith. They're called in Romans 12, and everybody receives a measure of faith, faith that en ed enables them to do something in the body, and the body is an assembly term. Everybody understands that. The body's not talking about dissembled is talking about the church together in one place at one time. And there's different ministrations that take, take place at that time. Each person can give what they've been given, and that's all. It's not a, this was one of the weaknesses of the mutual ministry movement that sprang up some years ago. Everybody had a chance to talk, but the only trouble was that most of the talk was just nothing more than opinion. But you have a right to share anything you've been given to see. Anything that's, cl that's clear to you. Don't assume the rest of us know it. Most people don't know how dangerous it is taking the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh I, I know. It, and we're to leave and I know. damnation to himself. That's not that's the right. the Lord body. So this was there many weeks and sick him on you and many sleep. Yeah, that's a, that was a result of them. Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. See, it's, it's not a ritual. No, uh, but it is treated all my life, Brother Charlie. I saw it treated as a ritual. The dumbest prayers I heard were at the Lord's table, and the shortest words were at the Lord's table. And I finally realized hey, I don't think people know what's going on here. Yes, it's serious. Yeah. See, you can't be wrong about Jesus. And this is, here's where your remembrance of Jesus is like brought to a, 
brought to a peak. He says, this blood, this cup is the New Testament. <laughs> In my blood. Yeah, you're right, Brother Charlie. See, again, that has to do with Jesus. You can't, you can't be wrong or sloppy about Jesus. I used to go places to preach, and uh, they always had the famous bulletin, you know, and the back page was always filled up with sick people all the time. So I asked one one time, I said, have you ever thought of checking out how you take the Lord's table? Got all these sick people here. I mean, I'm, I understand. I'm not sitting in judgment. I'm just saying if I was you, I'd at least give some consideration to this. Many, he said, are weak and sickly. <laughs> weak mean I gather we're on the decline, physically on the decline, and some died. But I think if Paul hadn't have told them that, they'd have never made the connection. <laughs> so you're right. Now they were, uh, these ministers who were apostles, he said they were ministers of the word. Word there meaning not word like the or word mean message. They're ministered of a, of a word. You have a word, remember when Paul was in and uh, Barnabas in the synagogue, he said, do you have a word for us? And what he meant was a message. You have a message, a word of exhortation. It's a whole message. See, so they were ministers of the word or the message. They took the message that God wanted given to the church and they delivered it faithfully to the church. Remember there on the day of Pentecost, before the people were baptized, Peter said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That was before they were baptized. I've never heard anybody say that, the baptismal candidates. <laughs> so I said it myself, just to make sure it was said. It's what they said, wasn't it, Brother Charlie? You know what he said? Save yourselves from this untoward generation. See, they, that's how serious salvation is. That's how much gravity there is to salvation. This is not just like an everyday thing. That's right. That's right. Well, why do you call me Lord? Do not the things that I command. That's right. <laughs> so, given the situation of many other people taking in hand to say this, but evidently not saying it correctly or properly or orderly, he says, it seemed good to me. It seemed good to me to take in hand to do this myself, to write this down. I had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first. Now he got it from God. But it wasn't instead of the apostles. You understand that? That Paul prayed that the church would have the eyes of their understanding opened up, be given the spirit of wisdom and knowledge in him. That's the, that's the same thing was available to, to Luke. I guess this is how he had this perfect understanding. It wasn't because he was a scholar. Because he was a believer. And God took what the apostles said and like flowered it out to him. But let me, let me read to you what, our, what other versions, how they translate this. Here's the New American Standard. Having investigated everything carefully from the beginning. Here's the NIV. I myself have invested everything thoroughly from the beginning. Here's the Revised Standard Version. Having followed all things closely for some time past. Here's the American Standard Version. Having traced the course of all things accurately from the first. Here's the basic Bible English. Made observation with great care of the direction of events and their order. English Revised Version. Having traced the course of all things accurately from the first. I won't read anymore. Downright depressing. Does anyone here really think that Luke's gospel is a result of his summarization of all the existing writings that were available? Is that, does anyone really think a book like that's in the Bible? I'm going to dismiss that as a, just a bad. I'm going to, and I'll, I give some quotations here, but historically, People in up until say about uh, 
late 1700s, everybody knew it was what the text says there. But then at the beginning of the late 1700s and 1800s, this other idea cropped up. And I see what had happened. Men, men still do this today. They take, a, they take a lexicon, and a lexicon has a major part and a minor part. The major part gives you the definition of the root word, and the minor part says the various uses. And invariably, they will take the uses and say that's what it means. But that's not, <laughs> that's not how to read a lexicon. So what these men did, they took the various uses of this word and they finally found one that agreed with what they thought. And, and you will be able to find one that no matter how or what you believe, you'll find a meaning that will kind of agree with what you said. So the perfect understanding he had was exactly that. Now, if, if Luke's gospel really was a compilation of existing documents and words, now to confirm that that can't be what it is, I list here 52 things that Luke reports in his gospel that is nowhere reported someplace else. 52 things that Luke recorded that nobody else recorded. Now how can, you, how can a person know this and think this is a compilation of thoroughly investigating all the records and so forth? Pardon? Think Luke interviewed Mary personally? Well, I, I don't know. There's a person who said they, they thought they did. They did. That, that, that he got it from Mary. But, uh. He certainly had the opportunity. Yeah, he had the opportunity. He, he could have interviewed others too, the apostles. But this, this isn't the way that Scripture is written. We're told all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. He didn't say some Scripture. If it's written down, in God's name, God gave it. Now, he, as I say, I think some of the, he didn't know what the apostles said, but he like filled in things that weren't supplied before that weren't like essential for faith, but they were things you, de you need to know about Christ. And God gave him this commission, I think, to do this. And what all was involved in it, I'm not sure, but when he said I had a perfect understanding and the, historically, the commentators have all agreed that's what it meant in the ancient translations. That's what the, it was just later, this other idea come up. I'm going to, and he said, I'm going to write them in order, a logical sequence, so to speak. For instance, here's, here's some scriptural sequences. First, foreknowledge then predestination, then calling, then justification, then glorification. That's Romans 8, 29, and 30. It's just a categorical statements. First come, then learn. Come unto me, learn from me. First keep, then do. Keep the commandments to do them. First deny yourself, then take up your cross, then follow Jesus. See, I'm showing there's a, there's a sequence of things. First repent, then be baptized. First a schoolmaster, then faith comes. First suffering, then reigning. See, so all through Scripture, we're taught to think this way, that there's no sporadic nature to spiritual experience. There's a certain order related to it. And why? Why is it this so? Because it's conducive to review and to pondering. It's hard to view something that's random and really get anything out of it. But when, when there's an orderliness to it, it can be diagnosed and summarized in a godly manner and you can see, kind of see the scope of things. You're enabled to see the scope of things rather than a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit there. And it's the seeing the scope of things that clears the mind up. Once the whole picture dawns on you, and it, it's some, it generally takes a while before this happens. Read the whole story. Oh, yes. And then the, when you see the whole picture, like what God's doing, what is, what is he doing in salvation? Once you see that, all these parts make sense. Amen. And you realize I can't be disobedient and be part of the, <laughs> part of the process. This is how it works. 
So there was a birth. There was a birth and preparatory ministry of John the Baptist. See, that was Jesus just didn't come. There was a little plow work done first of John the Baptist, then there was the ministry of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus, and then there was the growth of Jesus. He grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Then that is baptism. He is set apart and commenced his ministry. Then he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights to kind of get him ready. There was the ministry of Jesus. And then there was a, a growing opposition that happened. Then there was the betrayal of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the appearance of the risen Jesus, and the ascension of Jesus. He was... It was sequential. He didn't hop back and forth between heaven and earth. He finished what he was doing here first, then, then he went back. And you can't try and hop around either. You can't just kind of hop scotch, try and hop scotch through life. There has to be like an orderliness. You got to be headed for the goal, yeah. right? Read the whole story. And head for the goal. You're running a race that has a termination point, and the objective is to get there without spot. Amen. To be found without blame when Jesus comes. And you've got to have everything God said to help you along the way. Amen. Amen. None of God's words are incidental or without significance. It's a progressive work. Here in Ephesians 4, he says that he gave gifts to men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, for, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, huh? that we no more be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but might grow up into Christ in all things, it's admonishing one another teaching one another in love, able to edify one another. That's the objective. Why? Because we're going to, we're, we're going to glory. We're going to be presented as a group. The church is going to be presented with the bride. The church is the bride. The objective is to get there. Once, once you reconcile yourself to that objective, then it makes sense. God till, When God says... Sin not. That's what he meant. Perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. That's what he meant. Be ye separate. That's what he meant. Touch not the unclean thing. That's what he said. Abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. That's what he meant. Not just so you fulfill a command, but so that you're ready when you disembark from here to there. That's the aim. And he closes by saying that thou, you might know the certainty, the certainty of the things, of these things, the certainty of them. Everything that we're building on is rock solid. Nothing is ambiguous or uncertain. It's rock solid. But when you come in, this isn't seen that clearly when you first come in. That's why you got to grow. Everybody has to grow up into Christ in all things. Because the certainty of these things is not divulged to the babies. It's when you grow up that all these things, the certainty of them, registers on your soul. Why? Why is that? Because you're able to put it together. Now, this is my own assessment. One of the major weaknesses of the modern Christendom is that it can't think and draw conclusions. You can give it scriptural facts that they do not know how to arrive at a conclusion. It's absolutely phenomenal. I deal with this every day on the on internet. They don't know how to they in other words, they don't see the whole they don't see the whole picture. The whole story of Christ well, I don't like the word story, but whole account of Christ is called by Luke what he began to do and teach. What he began, he's still doing and teaching. Amen. Son of God is coming, has given us an understanding. He's still teaching. 
Paul said to the Ephesians, the four, Ephesians 4, 20 and 21, If so be that ye have heard him and been taught by him the truth as it is in Jesus. They never heard Jesus in the flesh, but he's speaking from heaven. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh from heaven. But see, until you see that, it's just a big handicap. It's a large handicap. You're, but when you know he's speaking from heaven, his word is powerful. He can say to Satan, be gone. That's it. He can say to you, be strong. He's speaking from heaven, though. So whatever, uh, surely there's nothing between you and heaven tonight, but if there is, uh, get it out of the way. Whatever it is. Whatever, whatever is, is like a wedge between you and God. And that's something that makes it a little difficult to have extended thoughts about God, a little difficult to live for God, a little difficult to be holy, a little difficult to, quote, go to church, whatever. Whatever you have in your life that has that effect, get it out of there. Amen. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, Jesus asked that question, didn't he? All of that has this to do with this text we dealt with. Luke saw all these things. He saw the criticality of having an orderly and accurate view of Christ. So he's going to tell us about um, things about him that will put the picture together for you. Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? Well, Judah? When Jesus healed the blind man, he put mud on his eyes the first time. He said, can you see? And he says, I see men as trees walking, which was to be described as not, but not being able to see clearly, knowing the certainty of those things, which we've been instructed yeah. in. Yeah. You, can't, you can't do it when you see it as trees, when you see yeah. it unclearly, when things are blurred. Yeah. You can't see it clearly, but by reason of use, have your senses exercised, as in Hebrews chapter 5 so that Christ can open your eyes more so that you can see the truths that are certain for what they really are. Amen. 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 Yeah, Jesus didn't leave him being able to see men as trees walking, did he? Give him that. Of course, you remember the city, he had to take him out of, he had to take him out of that city to even do that. He had to get him out of there. So there's, <laughs> there's some places <laughs> you got to leave. He's not going to like to convert a man in the bar room. I've heard people say he did, you know, but I think they lied. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the fact that the scriptures are so orderly and the way that the truth is, is it all fits together, it, it, it's very compelling. When you, when, yeah. when you come up against something and you know you don't see it right, you just stick with it, believe it, uh, and, and, and pursue it because it does fit in. Yes, there is amen. A, everything God has done and is doing, it, it all fits together with what his main objective, his eternal purpose. And so it, it's very um, comforting to know that it doesn't hinge on your understanding, it hinges on your belief of the truth. Amen. And then the understanding amen. will come. Amen. And you receive the love of the truth yes. that you might be saved. Yeah. All right, we'll have a closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Brother Luke, for his faithfulness and diligence. It's a noble example for us all. We thank you you raised him up to minister to Brother Paul. Now tonight, Father, help us to digest uh, these things that Luke has written, to see the gravity of believing the certainty of the things that we have been exposed to. And where it's needed, increase our faith, Father, and help our unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen.